So we're just doing a little agenda making um, while we wait for people to arrive. Um, if you're new, um, please check out the meeting notes. If you're online, I'll put them in again because I don't think the chat's persistent. Um, add yourself um, into the attendee list and would love to have two volunteers as scribes. Um, that just means you write down whatever you hear. We have two people so that, you know, if you miss something, you don't have to stress about it. And um, if then you can feel free to talk and somebody else will write stuff down. Although everyone is welcome to help out scribing. We just want to make sure that we have at least two people um, who can capture notes um, so that people can review them later. And um, so that we're not completely biased to people who are awake at this time um, because we have people in quite a few time zones um, across the world. So I saw that the discussion of the supply chain proposal was uh, proposed on the agenda. Is there a person who has proposed that? I didn't check to make sure Santiago is here. Uh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. I don't know if you propose that, but we can chat about it. Uh, I didn't propose it, but I, uh, I volunteered myself to uh, be the voice of that here today. Great. I think people Is wanted it to be discussed, but I think uh, nobody, nobody could make it from the people, from the people that wanted it to be discussed. So is there, maybe I just ask, is there anybody who wanted it to be discussed who's on the call today? We could just move that to next week. Okay. Will Sounds you good. be here next week? Yes. Great. So I'll just move that to next week. Oops, I just deleted something. There we go. And I'm going to put the, the this one actually last so that because Michael might be here to the towards the end of this meeting. He had to miss the beginning, um, depending on how things go. So um, thank you, Gareth, for joining. If anybody can be second scribe for the last 30 minutes, that would be awesome. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll wing it. Um, but let's just start with check-ins. Um, my name is Sarah Allen. I am one of the co-chairs of SIG Security. And um, I have been, um, I've been catching up on the OPA assessment um, and chiming in there on kind of wordsmithing like our summary and, and kind of trying to suggest ways it could be more concrete. And um, that's our, our number two, our second assessment that um, the team has done. And then um, in my uh, non-SIG security life, I've um, been thinking about how do we do streaming video over the internet and know that it's not coming from random people on the internet. Um, so, um, so that's kind of been fun. It's sort of security related, but not necessarily cloud. I don't know. Um, and, uh, and we met with our TOC liaisons this morning. It was more of a kickoff. It wasn't like a, a big decidery meeting, um, but, uh, but generally it was positive and they, um, they said they really liked the momentum of this group and the enthusiasm, how um, folks are scrubbing in and you know, adding value and, and having a spirit of um, making security something that should be for everyone and openly and freely available. And, and Joe made the comment that, that there's some vendors where security is something you pay for. <laughs> he really liked the idea that we were um, contributing to a common so that security could be something that everybody gets to have. Um, so, so that's my little check-in. Um, sorry that went on a little long. Uh, Brandon, you're up next. Hey, um, yeah, so um, recently I've been kind of just um, doing the triage stuff. I closed a bunch of issues. No one has um, screamed at me yet, so I'm assuming that <laughs> it's all good. Um, 
I was looking at some of the PRs around the the identity category thing as well. Um, if we have, I guess, if we have time, we can talk about that a bit uh, later. Um, um, besides that, outside that, um, we are continuing work on the image encryption stuff, uh, container image encryption, um, which we have our PR LGTM in container D. Um, so hopefully we also have a KAP, which we're going to present the signal next week as well. So hopefully that goes well. And then at some point we can also share it with the group. That'd be fabulous. Great, great work. Um, and yeah, and I've been seeing you close things and every time I'm like, oh, good thinking there. Um, so appreciate that. And, um, and we should have time because I think we juggled the agenda around to talk about identity and access control. Um, next, uh, Gareth. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, it's uh, first time uh, joining the call. Um, uh, really just to sort of uh, catch up with what's going on and get more involved as I get more time. Uh, so I guess Potter's history. Uh, I used to work for the UK government doing a bunch of architecture and information security and automation things. Uh, I landed at Puppet for a while. I was at Docker most recently. I had a few months off, which is very nice. I've more recently just joined Sneak. Um, so small security uh, startup um, and getting back into a bunch of security things. Uh, I know like uh, Michael, so I'm catching up with him tomorrow in London and I know Justin, a few other people involved. Uh, it's felt like a, a useful thing that aligned with things I like doing, but also now what I'm doing for work as well, which is handy. Great, thanks for coming and joining us. Um, and maybe we'll add, if we have time, the, uh, the new member proposal of like we're we're working on a guide for new members and that might be a good thing to um, point yeah, out. Uh, I will happily test that out. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, Roger, are you have poor Wi-Fi but can you speak? Uh, we'll see. I can speak. We'll see if you can hear. Um, so um, I'm as you know PM on our Kubernetes distro at SUSE. Um, I am here in Nuremberg, mainly conspiring about um, integrating and containerizing our OpenStack Cloud and uh, Ceph distributions on top of our Kubernetes and figuring out how not to turn our networks into a giant swamp of, uh, of crosstalk and uh, insecurity and and fun things like trying to convince people that maybe we shouldn't be running user work on the same Kubernetes that we're uh, running the control planes. Um, and I know I've said this before about having more time, but it looks like we're really in the home stretch of releasing stuff. So it looks like I will have more time. My next thing is going to be uh, cube huntering our release radically before it gets out this time instead of six months after. <laughs> and um, as, I've, as I told people at the face-to-face -face in Barcelona, um, I would love to start at the very least riding along on um, assessments. Great. I think chiming in on that issue is the way to volunteer. Uh, the first five assessments issue. Yeah, okay, uh, I shall. Excellent. Um, thanks for that check-in. And next up is Martin. Hello, hello from me. Uh, I'm Martin and um, it's my first time here. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am working at VMware and I'm in the open source team in the security sub team in the open source. And um, so I will have to listen more currently. I have many things to read and to get familiar with, um, yeah, with what guys you're doing. Um, it, it will be exciting time for, time for me and hopefully I want to help you and contribute in future. Good, thank you, welcome. Um, then Christian. Hi, I'm Christian. I work on cloud security at Google. 
um, uh, one of the things I'm interested in is this this notion of you know, how some of our customers have these platform teams and I'm still trying to work on that. Um, I'll probably get access to some of our customers so I can actually ask them. Um, so we, um, I will be part of customer visits. So that, that will make that easier to answer that question. So no progress on that for me besides me, you know, trying to make progress in the long run. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Christian. Um, TK. Yeah, so I did have an opportunity to join a IEEE Future Network a roadmap, which I reported uh, quite a few months ago, I guess, and it's going very slow. They do have a security SIG group, um, I mean, security group basically under them, focusing on the 5G, those of you that may be just not familiar with that. So the, um, the pl positive side of it is that there is a lot of, uh, you know, it's a very large scope that they are actually trying to address the security, but so it has everything literally. But that's also the negative side of it because in, in my, from my uh, own observation, I am a little frustrated because it's not focused well in the sense of I don't see anything tangible that would be coming out anytime soon, even though it's a long roadmap. It's a 10-year roadmap for security as well as edge automation, application services. Everything relates to the 5G. So the uh, any newcomer that will come in there <laughs> probably will get confused thinking that, okay, well, this is too much. You know, where do we start? Where does it end? And how do we get a handle on it? So that's one of the concerns that I express. Let's see what happens. <laughs> that's all I have to report. Great. Thanks, TK. Mm -hmm. I know we sort of owe, uh, owe each other a conversation about um, edge and how it relates to cloud native and where that fits. Um, so hopefully can follow up on that next week. Um, Dan Shaw. Dan, fellow co-chair. I'm on mute, sorry, off mute. Uh, so uh, yes, one of the, our co-chairs. Uh, I've been uh, you know, tied up with some uh, work obligations the last few weeks, so I've uh, uh, haven't been uh, as active as I usually am, um, but uh, you know, in that, uh, I've, I've been uh, you know working uh, you know, with, with our uh, TUSA liaisons and, and the other stuff that uh, Sarah mentioned that the uh, chairs are, are doing to you know help continue shepherding everything forward. Thanks, Dan. Aaron. Uh, likewise, have not done uh, too much uh, in the past week on this. Um, uh, on some other data security stuff, uh, but I did see the comments on the uh, landscape and it looks like uh, we're scheduled to discuss those a little bit later during this meeting. So Brandon, looking forward to that conversation. Thank you. And then next up is Svi. Svi, do we have audio? Maybe. Uh, hi, everybody. Great. All right. I'm sorry. I couldn't find the unmute button. Uh, I'm Sri from Aqua. Uh, I've been, been on and off in these meetings a little bit, uh, but now it's really getting interesting as we start to talk about uh, identity um, uh, management authorization and stuff like that, because that's my, my background. So uh, I'm really curious to see uh, what we can uh, contribute uh, to, to that area of, uh, of Kubernetes. Super. Thanks, Sri. Santiago. Hey, um, so yeah, I've been missing from the meetings for a while. I felt that it was a somewhat of a conflict of interest to be here while I was being having to review for the Intoto project, which uh, it's finally uh, done, I think. And uh, we, Yay! <laughs> we used it on the presentation for the CNCF uh, last week. So that, uh, that was, I think, a great milestone uh, here. And uh, well, now I'm looking forward to like uh, future Future projects. I'm uh, very excited about this uh, software supply chain uh, catalog and uh, resources. I've been actually taking up through papers because I think we can also add uh, elements of uh, like academic literature and theoretical background and link to it too, so people can take it if they want to. Um, but yeah, I think that's a discussion that we can have next week when everybody that's also excited can uh, chime in. 
Super. Thanks, Santiago. Carlos. Hey, this is Carlos. I'm working as a speech researcher here at Intel in some uh, internal projects uh, that we want to implement uh, with Kubernetes and also uh, on the CI CD pipeline, different uh, testing different security tools. Uh, that's pretty much all that I do the last week. Thanks. Ash. Hi, I'm Ash. I work on the Open Policy Agent. Um, I'm just reviewing any comments you guys may have on the OPA security status documentation and uh, also looking at interesting integrations for OPA this week. Uh, Sarah, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, so in wrapping up our check-ins, I want to um, note, Santiago, if you have a chance to, dig, to link to the Intoto security assessment for the newcomers, it might be interesting for them to see that recently completed oh. from the group. Yeah, I'll, I'll link to it uh, right away. Where, where's the best place in the... Um, in the notes, or if you put it in the chat, maybe one of the note takers can move it over. Um, here are the notes. Which the chat doesn't seem to be preserved in history. Um, come in. So, um, so I wanted to do a quick shout out to, I'll just take care of some um, uh, quick items first. The, uh, the new member page, um, we had a proposal that um, I like, I personally like the proposal that there's um, buddies for um, people who are new. And um, I forgot who said that they were new and was willing to try out our new member page. Gareth, I think. Gareth? Yeah, I, 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 I think I'm happy to uh, take a look and uh, provide some feedback. Excellent. If you could look at it, it's an issue state with like, you know, some, some ideas in there. Um, and I wanted to just see if there was anybody who's enthusiastic about trying out this buddy idea. Wait, on which side? As like uh, someone who, who's been part of the project for a while or as a new person? Somebody. By the way, I'm a new person, so nobody knows who I am or my voice. Hello, new person. <laughs> Hi. What's your, so um, did you see the notes that I just put into the uh, chat? Yeah, I have the. Uh... Uh, did you, you're not that new. <laughs> I've, been, I've been on calls before. I haven't had video on, and I've talked, I've, I've, uh, talked to you, Sarah, like once or like you were in San Francisco, and, and like we had a spare meeting room or something at the uh, whatever hotel. I can't even remember it. Um, yeah. So, well, you have been to the meeting before. We have some people who this is their very first meeting. Um, so, uh, so yes. So, I think that last time we, we just mentioned this in passing, and I said anybody who wants, in order to have a buddy program, we must have, the newcomers must have people who've been here for a little while who are willing to volunteer to be buddies, to be the more experienced person in a buddy set. So um, I don't wanna put anybody on the spot. Um, I'll just put it out there that if you're willing to be a buddy, add yourself to the issue and say you're volunteering to be in the first set of buddies. Um, if we don't get any volunteers, then we will not be doing a buddy program until we have more volunteers. So, um, so I can volunteer myself on the experience side, but I wonder if I am experienced enough. I think you're as experienced as anybody. Okay. Um, so you'll just try it out and you'll Let's have questions and then we'll figure it out. Okay. Um, so Santiago will be Gareth's buddy. Yay. Um, and you'll try out our buddy program. And then if we have, um, if we have any other, uh, I don't want to take up too much space for this buddy matchup thing. Um, if you are an experienced person who've been here for, you know, a couple months or whatever, at least since the last, you know, KubeCon EU, I think it, we had like a big upsurge of people. So if you've been like around enough to kind of have a sense of like, you've done a PR and contributed in some way and, um, just uh, volunteer to be a buddy. You can shout out on chat, people can match up or, um, and add yourself to the issue so that we kind of know that we have a few people willing to do this. Okay. Um, thanks everyone. 
Um, and also, like, feel free to shout out. Well, like, let's figure out we, that we have some experienced buddies, and then we'll we'll volunteer for new people to have buddies. Um, all right. So now I'm going to actually turn it over to Brandon. Are you volunteering to lead to facilitate a discussion about identity and access control categories? Yeah, sure. Um, so I don't know if um, Aaron, you're here, right? Uh, yeah, I am, sure. Yeah, okay. So yeah, um, I think so. this whole space around this issue, I think I think the PR, but I didn't think the issue. Um, so Sarah, you opened this issue talking about uh, called landscape identity and access control categories confusing. Um, it seems like the main kind of point of contention here is that um, some people kind of see identity and access control is something, a component which every project needs. And so it creates some ambiguity there. So, uh, thank you, sir. Um, I linked the wrong, uh, yeah. I linked the wrong issue, sorry. I'm trying to find the right one. Is this not the right issue? Uh, no, this isn't the right issue. I'm, oh, sorry. Let's find it. It's, it's the one before, that's a pull request. It's I think we get something that yeah. Oh, I was just linking the, um, this is the... Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so Aaron, Aaron um, proposed some changes, which I thought were pretty interesting. Um, but I think a lot of it, um, a lot of the discussions I feel like would be open to a broader group. Um, Aaron, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of the, the changes that you're, you're proposing here? Yeah, mute. Uh, sorry, once the thing went full screen, I lost my ability to demute. Um, yeah, so um, I guess I was trying to clarify the different things that might be involved in um, uh, might be identity and access specific projects uh, that we would want to um, guide people about uh, as they're sort of exploring, you know, building their own cloud native projects. Uh, and so looking at the, the overall CNCF landscape, which is like, I guess, 900 different um, associated projects, uh, just started thinking about how to maybe categorize uh, this section. Uh, and so I kind of approach it from the perspective of someone who uh, has had to implement uh, sort of consistent identity uh, for companies as a, as a defender, uh, where there's a whole bunch of people uh, who built a whole bunch of services with not a lot of compliance, uh, not or sorry, not a lot of um, consistency, um, and just trying to break out like what are the functions that um, what are the functions that we'd want to uh, break this category down further into? And uh, I chose to give some exemplars of uh, specific projects or protocols or technologies, uh, mostly in an effort to help sort of clarify what I meant by these things, uh, but we don't have to include them or not. Uh, and so um, I specifically, because the term identity is, is so used, I specifically added the word life cycle. Um, certainly, I know that's up for debate. Um, but the idea here is that uh, having sort of an official understanding of what a principle is, a principle being a specific user um, or a specific service uh, and its life cycle, creation, um, um, you know, creation, transition, granting of entitlements, removing of entitlements, um, granting of attributes, removing of attributes, uh, that there's a, a specific, I feel like there's a specific focus set of tools around that activity alone and that it's worth categorizing um, that specific set of what is an identity and what do we know about it um, tools as one specific subcategory of identity and access management. So I'll, I'll pause there and say, you know, Brandon, does that make sense? Is it one category? Is it multiple categories? Like, how do you want to approach that? Um, 
you know, did we did we break it down in, in a sensible way here? Yeah, I think um, definitely the clarification. So you guys are giving some examples of what what type of um, identity functions and access control functions um, projects may have definitely helps. Um, the thing that, that I wanted to kind of hear more opinions on was um, for this specific roadmap document, uh, what's, what's our thoughts on including specific um, specific examples of projects on this? Um, I know initially we, we mentioned Spiffy and things like that, but um, I wasn't sure for this specific document whether um, would we want to move examples to a different document and leave this more for definitions or do we want to add the examples here as well? So I'm thinking that there is that's sort of what, what we muddle up here. So, so one of the things I'm seeing is there's identity provisioning and identity consumption, right? What you typically call authentication is actually the consumption of an identity, right? It gets provided by somebody. And I can clearly see that we want to have the provisioning and management of these identities um, to, be, to be a separate thing, right? You know, an, an active directory versus an OIDC um, a validation step. Right, uh, you know, Active Directory is kind of the, the management and provisioning of identities and, and the OIDC um, um, validation is kind of the authentication step. So I think that would be a, so, a bit that makes oh, sense to me. I, well, I do, I, I generally agree with this, like that the separation is important. I want to just clarify that there are, exist systems where author, where the, the authentication step is not a consumption of identity where um, the you can your your identity can be decoupled from like the credential that allows you to come back and um, and do not be identified by um, your authentication if that makes sense like particularly in government where you're worried about the privacy of the individual, you may sign up for an account using your identity, right? Like if you're like, say a veteran and you're getting health services that the VA might, um, you have your identity with the Veterans Administration and it gives you a credential that says you are a veteran. And then when you go to Health and Human Services, which does not need to know who you actually are in order to give you um, health medical stuff because you're a veteran <laughs> you know like that that decoupling in some systems is important so it's just like a i don't know maybe that was in the weeds no i don't i don't think so i think that is actually interesting and i don't think we capture that at all right because that becomes interesting if people start thinking about uh, privacy issues right we, we got we got questions at some kubecon about gdpr at the time um, and and this this split um, helps you think about that and reason about that. Yeah, yeah. and for me, the, the word life cycle, I actually find very helpful here, right? Because it's sort of like, it explains that like, there's this whole thing about like creating an identity and like it's its own kind of set of expertise and, and stuff. So when it is one question, I guess, for Christian, and, and I, if that makes a lot of sense, the separation of provisioning and consumption and that definitely you're right, right? Like the the that those are those are definitely typically different activities, and provision is particular provisioning is particularly important in larger organizations. Um, if you had to split those into two, and you were looking at something like an LDAP server, right? Like a, a free radius, well, radius is consumption, but something like specifically an LDAP server, which is both used as a directory and an agent for provisioning, but is also often used as the place where um, you know, attributes are consumed and even um, uh, even uh, passwords verified, like where would that fit or, or do we just accept that some things are, you know, some, some systems are multifunctional and, and so, um, you know, an LDAP server would live in both identity lifecycle provisioning and identity consumption. I, I think there are some, so if, if you, if you use some some uh, open standards, you, you you have an easier way of separating those two, 
right? I think especially for password verification, there are options to, to, to do some of that. Um, but um, I, I think a lot of times when you think about one of these, these identity problems, you tend to cover both aspects, right? You, you tend to cover, you know, I need to provision this identity and I also need to allow people to consume them easily further down the road, right? So I think Spiffy does some of that as well. Um, so I don't think you can ever completely separate that. But if you, if you follow a standard, you could, right? You can provide a directory that vends OIDC tokens, right? So the validation step can be completely separate from what you do. No, I think that's, that makes sense. Although, for the purpose of decomposing the landscape of projects, is that is helpful because there are so many projects, as you note, know, right? If I if I compare this to the the CNCF landscape document and say we're trying to create a specific um, CNCF landscape, specific CNCF security landscape, then it's not just about new standards; it's also about helping people trying to engage with cloud security understand what their options are. Yeah, and, and I think that that's, that that's actually exactly what, what we need to do because the, 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 the idea that, that every project or, or even an application is going to store its own users doesn't really happen anymore. I mean, every, everybody's going towards uh, actually centralized user information where the identity is owned usually by the person and they trust some entity to, uh, to provision aspects of that record to certain providers under the consent of the person that owns the data, which is usually the individual. So the idea is that, that for most projects, you will need to rely on a service and, and there are protocols, you know, SAML and OpenID and all, all those kind of things that do, that do identity federation. And, and I, I don't think that, that anybody in the right mind would now actually take on um, housing and protecting and, 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 uh, and destroying, we're talking about GDPR, uh, identity information that's tied into an individual. So one question I had that, that this discussion sparked is like, is this consumption of identity synonymous with credentials? Like, I, like it, it was just kind of back to Aaron's question of like, are these different services or are they always coupled and then we might as well make them one category because we don't want to have everything in two categories. There's various reasons to decouple them these days, right? So one of them is that these, these identity validations are typically costly because they involve, so it's a purely technical argument, right? So, so you try to exchange them for something that you that can use symmetric encryption in your, in your mesh or something like that. Right, and that also then serves as this secondary credential that is decoupled from your actual identity. So there's a purely technical reason, and there's also a, a you know, I'm not sure. And are we seeing? I'm, I'm not as familiar with all the different things in this space. Like, are they? Are are we seeing an emergence of different projects that, that do the different parts of it? I I think we, I I mean I certainly think we are right. We're seeing different ways of managing the attributes that go to identity. I, I see different libraries and plugins for consuming different kinds of access tokens. Um, you know, Spiffy, when I look at Spiffy, it seems much more about the issuance of credentials. And while it provides some very loose guidelines about how to consume them, um, I think most of the the work in the consumption space is actually be done, being done by like their commercial partners. So, so I, I would say that distinction definitely resonates with me. Exactly how to communicate it clearly, I'm I'm, I'm maybe noodling on a little bit too. Um, just a question: Will we classify a project under multiple categories? I think that we we basically have used as a guiding light that out. Our landscape would be perfect if everything fell into a single category. We don't expect that to actually be reality, be, partly because we're in this emerging space and early um, offerings, early projects often had to build something that now is a, broken out and there's things you can use for. So just kind of because of history, we'll have projects that do a lot of things, right? And then therefore they would be in multiple categories. But we believe that a lands 
for the landscape to be useful, we want the categories to divide the products into projects into buckets, right? And so we were, that's kind of where we've been in previous conversations. There's probably, um, there is probably also a, um, another aspect of the identity that is the, that affects the whole security aspects. That's the identity spoofing. So, um, and that, of course, the identity directly maps to your credentials, to credentials, to your authorization, and all those things. So even if you put them into separate categories, there is clear, obvious relationship among them that affects the actual uh, security preservation. So if someone spoofs the identity, that affects the whole thing down the chain line, right? And, and you have to be able to trace that back. You have to be able to shut it down. You have to be able to take all the precautionary access, uh, precautionary steps rather to, to preserve your security. So I like the idea of separating them, but at the same time, we have to keep in mind that they're related and they're very relevant and one affects the others. Does that make sense? I, I, I think actually, so, the question that we have to, to understand is, do we want to take the ownership of being the identity provider? Or are there's going to be a set of uh, services that you're going to trust? And if you get a valid uh, token with the right encryption, with the right timestamp and so on, you're actually going to um, trust that an identity is not spoofed, that it's been correctly validated. And then really all you need to do is based on the attributes that you get in an assertion, for instance, you would then authorize it for the permitted actions. Uh, because I think that, that, uh, uh, that, that's what's been going on you know, over the last you know, 15 years is that, that applications are, 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 don't want to own the entire user record, don't want to worry about spoofing, don't want to worry about housing passwords and the authentication and, and the advanced authentication and all those mechanisms for two-factor authentication and so on. So, there are the, the, those mechanisms that do all that, and then if, we, if, we, if you uh, trust uh, that that service is providing you an assertion with the right identity uh, identifier, then um, you, you really don't need to worry if it's spoofed or not. You know, that, that service has done that, presumably. Well, it seems like, I, I think what DK was also saying is that the, the interface between these two services are, is a bit more complex than a regular integration of a service because you know you have to maintain more than just a call out you have to make sure that um the correct trust is, is established as well as you know maintaining certain revocation lists and uh, certain information about key hierarchy as well it's like a pretty tightly coupled integration rather than just for example like calling out the database or something like that Right. I, I was also thinking about, you know, somewhat probably in a little bit in the futuristic manner, but it's more like the dynamic uh, nature of this spoofing. And uh, let's not underestimate that part, because just because you have an identity confirmed at one event, at one trigger point, and then you have an application that is triggered, an application is in the process, and then the identity may have been spoofed right in the middle, and someone else is also um, having access to the same applications as such, how do you maintain that um, uh, integrity? Those things need to be thought about, even though they seem like a little bit far-fetched right at this moment, but it's not too far-fetched, I believe. So I'm trying, I'm struggling to figure out how that, I think you're right that we do need to reason about those things and figure out whether we have, you know, where we have gaps and whether there's, um, you know, tools or processes or whatever it is to address those type of vulnerabilities. The question is when it comes to the landscape where the purpose is to um, create categories for different projects, I'm struggling to see like, how does that, that area, that body of like open questions apply to this, these set of categories? Like is there a is there a so there might be, different category or there might be, I guess under consumption of identity, 
some category around um, what RSA calls like adaptive authentication or like um, identity intelligence, something along those lines. So there might be a category there around people who are nominally threat intelligence providers, but also help you, um, you know, help you consume logs of identities, help you consume the context of authentications and make better decisions about whether a particular, um, a particular authentication event might be fraudulent. So, so I, I think it's a reasonable thing to add. I can't name other than like RSA adaptive auth off the top of my head. Um, particular, I guess Cloudflare might have something in that space. What, what I was um, thinking about. I can't name. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, what I was thinking about a little, little simpler version, like you still have a separate category, just like everybody said, and there is enough justification to have those separately uh, categorized in the landscape. But at the same time, if we could create a matrix that shows the relationship between these categories, and perhaps even we can identify a little more specific relationship in there. Uh, I would hate to use the word API. It's not API, but it's somewhat of a relationship how one affects the other. So that way, if we are uh, doing something on the management of specific category, then we are cognizant of the fact that it might have some effect on the other one. And uh, if we can keep track of that in the landscape, like a, a two dimensional map or even three dimensional, <laughs> but I think two dimensional is good enough, uh, then perhaps it will keep us straight, at least not to forget that the implications there might be, even if we did not resolve it at this very moment. That makes sense. I actually really like that idea. Um, and we could go a bit further as well, right? We could also say that um, the network stuff or the storage stuff should also call out to central access management or access control service. Um, and this will get people to start thinking about um, making that a consumer rather than implementing it their own. Right, and that might also actually help with this this whole cat like the whole category of identity access management kind of stemmed from like well okay well if you have storage that that needs to do access management right. is that in the access management category and we can say like no it's not because everything ha like this is how they're I struggle to actually imagine how it would be visually described uh, but I I love the idea because I it's sort of this n dimensional thing in my head. Um, but when it, it gets to 2D, I'm, I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, it, 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 it gets complicated when, when the resources are also identities, right? You, you need, if, if you're a person trying to start or stop a workload, then the workload is a resource. However, that workload is also an identity that might have access to other resources or other workloads. So things, to tend to play a dual role, especially, especially when you start to talk about machine IDs versus pe people IDs. Uh, yeah, I think that we actually need to call out that there's people IDs and machine IDs. It, it's sort of implied with, I think, at Identity Federation single sign-on, to me that implies user identities, human identities, I should say. Um, well, maybe they're not humans always, but I think that, that it would be worth sketching out that, um, there are these different kinds of identities that What's are. The, uh, and this is a, in the chat, there's this discussion around the term machine identity versus service identity. Um, are they the same thing or are they different things? Uh, Do we even have machines in the cloud? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think we want to separate, you know, human entities and non-human non entities because human entities uh, uh, do have a different path of authentication usually. It's usually some kind of a password or proving your identity, while non-human entities usually have something that's assigned and, um, and everything is, is sort of inherent. And also the attributes, uh, if you're talking about uh, attribute-based access controls, which is a lot of information on the chat. Uh, also, the, you know, the, the non-human ideas have different attributes than the human ideas as well. 
So, so in, in, in my mind, what you typically have is you have a, uh, a service identity is the one that you're really interested in. And that gets established by some form of trust chain. And at the bottom of the trust chain somewhere is the machine. Right? And Maybe the service identity is one that you're ways. really interested in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a whole yeah. other set of people who like work at the, uh, you know, the application layer who don't necessarily get to make decisions about service identities, right? Um, and so depending on which layer of the stack you're examining, it'll have different concerns. But I, I think that it's a good point. Question. Yeah, so, so I actually have a question. Maybe I'm a little bit behind the discussion, but uh, if, if, we, if we move this from the identity aspect into the the resource aspect. What what are what are we authorizing access to? I think it's it it will help us determine, you know, what what information we would need to obtain in order to assert that access. So you're saying that there's a distinction between resources and identity. Well, certainly between authorization and identity, I think is the point. Right. Oh, okay, okay. I think you always authorize a request and then you can use different attributes of the request and one of them could be the resource name, right? Oh, so the access okay. policy could okay. be determined on the resource name okay. or it's just the service, right? Mm -hmm. Service meshes typically um, um, only argue in terms of service to service authorization, right? Or even just, of, yeah, authorization typically. Like you say, you know, service A is allowed to contact service B to, to do something. And then the resource-based one is kind of a level above that where you say, okay, maybe service A can only access resource C in service B and not resource D. Yeah, and, and that, that level of granularity also depends on your enforcement point, if it can actually do that and block access. To yeah, not all policies have that level of granularity. Yeah. Right. So the, the, the verb is kind of the other one. Can you only read or can you read and write, right? So, so those can be different, again, different attributes of the request, right? In REST yeah. or APIs, it's the HTTP verb that you can reason about. Well, not everything is HTTP requests, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, but, but actually, so, so, you know, the area of then access management is, is, is definitely not, not new. There's a lot of established uh, practice in that, uh, and I think you know there are there are tools, um, different protocols, different standards that that we can use, and uh, and we need to find the right tool for for the job. So if and if it's if it's extremely uh, generalized, as in we don't know what the resources are, uh, then it won't be one set of tools. And if we are more confident in what the resources are and what the level of granularity that's going to be required, then maybe we can look at the other subset of tools that are more geared towards that particular use case. But especially in the, in the context of CNCF, we have Kubernetes that gives us kind of a resource framework to, to think about, right? Of course, there's the, the arbitrary problem of, of dealing in authorization, but there's also the problem of dealing in authorization in the CNCF context, which is really what, what, what we are discussing here, right? So at least for the control plane, you have reasonably well-established standards here. Data plane is a different question, right? And, and uh, that, that, is, that is something we are currently grappling with a lot because we don't know how to, how to transfer that. Right, because I think there are some, some APIs like in the world, right? Don't have necessarily a resource model. Um, but like, I don't know whether under the hood, you know, at some point resource is a very general term. Um, in any case, I find this, the, I find the edit as written to be a helpful clarification and separating, you know, rather than bundling together authentication and authorization. Do, do we have in mind some concrete examples of, of what would require a, a, an authorization path? So I, I don't, and I, I actually would love input from the, the group here, which is we, we've talked a lot about um, this notion that like, resources need to make their own decisions. Um, and, and it does seem like that really is very much left up to the application teams without a lot of guidance as to how to do that. I think intuitively we all know that like read and write are different operations. Um, there might be major buckets of resources that you would want to authorize differently. Um, 
but I haven't found, you know, um, I, I, I can't off the top of my head think of any framework that lives outside of a given application for separating out or like what, what resources would be that is, you know, robust enough to talk about API access, robust storage access at the, you know, object level and, um, you know, that would be robust to both kinds of like resource stuff. So if there are, if folks are aware of any good frameworks for like application developers to put in to help them reason about these things, I, those would be examples I'd love to, I'd love to include. Isn't there a, um, isn't there some help from the OPA, for example, the policy, doesn't the policy decide as to what type of roles or if you are back or a back, it doesn't matter, uh, the credential based access. Yes, but it's still, that was the main reason for the OPA type of uh, project, right? That is the main reason for the type of OPA project and definitely as they build out their examples, um, you know, Ash, um, I'm, you may have something to add here. Um, that would definitely be referencing. I, I'm, we already, we already talk about that a little bit elsewhere. And so I'm just wondering if there's anything, um, anything else for more traditional RBAC like systems um, that would serve as a good entry point. Well, it might be good to include RBAC and ABAC as examples here under resource authorization. I, I, I find it helpful to the edit that includes having policy engines in that section because like it, it sort of seats it um, but yeah, we'd love to hear from Ash or whoever was about to speak about. Uh, so Could yeah, we... just a quick, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick comment on Aaron's uh, point. So uh, OPA is pretty general purpose, like you know, where you can do R back, A back, anything with OPA. It depends on how you author your policies. Is there something specific that you think OPA does not need or we need to kind of include uh, I'm not understanding that point. It's not very clear to me right now. Uh, I'm not thinking of anything specifically and just if there are common patterns, um, do you guys have some common patterns for how to do like admission control? No, I, it's, it's very, it's, it's loose to me at the moment. So I, I don't have a good, I don't have a good okay. specific. But well, I think about relying on Kubernetes, right? Well, if, you, if you do a, a kind of a CRD style um, um, control plane for your service, right? You can, you can use the services of the Kubernetes API server to do both RBAC and admission control. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> right. So I was just pointing out that like we, we have this edit, which is resource authorization. And I think what I interpret the, the question to be, are there things that aren't resources? Do we want to describe it in a way that doesn't use the term resource because that feels very specific? Or is, you know, or maybe it's not, right? Like we do have the Kubernetes example, as Christian mentions, that is like the CRD and it's a very formalized sense of what is a resource and how do you interact with it. But there are, you know, there are other models and maybe from the OPA experience, you have a good way of describing like, what are the things that we authorize? And should, is, is the resource term appropriate when we have a category that may be, may, maybe we want to leave open for other types of framing? Sarah, if you, if you follow kind of a, if you try to simplify everything to an object oriented model, you can literally describe the whole universe in different objects, right? So then you can consider that, okay, well, resource is an object. So any type of access to the resource is an object, um, access to that object. So literally, you know, from, from that perspective, I think you can probably bring everything in that model as an object type of things. And then you provide the grant or not granting access to that particular object, which may be just an action. You so know. I'm actually very familiar with the resource-based model, and I am a big fan of calling everything a resource. I also have been in API religious wars with people who are like, I, my thing is not a resource, and so I'm in your camp, but I know that there are other people not in that camp, so in just naming the category, that's what I was like saying is that 
do we want do to they, have some, do they, I, I don't know examples of the non-resource authentication that is hanging out in cloud, if there is any. I, I can't think of another name. Was there one that they recommended other than resource? No, I mean, I think we could just call it authorization. Just, I, okay. But uh, I don't know, uh, and maybe nobody cares and resource authentic. I, I wouldn't object to the, the PR as is. Sure. So this is Mark. I I could see us getting into a longer conversation about this, but uh, the HL7 fire standard has multiple sub standards around provenance, the uh, the authorization layer, the infrastructure for transporting authorization, the resources, and the RDF triple store associated with the domain models. Uh, I think because they're dealing with HIPAA and safety that the fire standard does a better job of any of the cloud native security projects that I've seen. Now getting into that is a bit of a deep dive. So that's kind of the risk of going into this territory. But, you know, if we had the time, I, I would think that's worth our time. Now, what we did with this in the NIST big data working group was try to do a crosswalk to some of their existing standards. I don't, it looks to me like that is not going to suit the more modest thing we have in mind for the landscape, but we might want to just put a placeholder here to go back and revisit the work that's been done in that standards organization. Yeah, thanks for the, I'm going to, uh, like, thanks for raising that. I want to um, close this thing because we've got just two minutes till the end of the hour. Um, and, and like, let's put a pin in that because we did have very early on discussions of wanting to sort of gather the relevant standards, right? And that could also be a lens on the categories, right? Where there are existing standards, right? Like maybe that means something to the categories or just cataloging what we collectively know as standards that are out there that are in wide use or that we recommend for whatever reasons to, as a service to the community. Um, so I'm going to pause there. I'll give Brandon and Aaron the homework of like figuring out whether we need to whether we ought to resume this next week and finish the conversation or whether um, you feel like this can be taken forward. Um, and I want to um, have one extra call out for volunteers for the microsite. We have um, all we have. We had selected six uh, presentations, maybe eight six to eight presentations from the last year and a half that seemed to be helpful to the group that were of presentation format. And those have all been uploaded to YouTube and with transcripts. So we um, want to like, basically they need to be like sort of, when, do the, when does the actual presentation start and end of the meeting and like just sort of sweeping through the transcript to be like, do we want to clean it up when we like publish it on a page? We'll probably still keep the transcript, right, of the meeting, but do, you know, like if we were going to have something that goes with the presentation, um, you know, if you're, if you're interested in listening to an old meeting and, you know, maybe pulling out some, a summary of it, um, would definitely love to have a couple of volunteers willing to do that. All right, Brendan, any last words on the identity and access control? Yeah, I'll, I'll continue chatting with Aaron about this. I, I think that def definitely uh, like some things that we can just push in there, uh, pull in directly and some things require to discuss a bit more. Yeah. Okay, super. Thanks, everybody. See y'all on Slack. Till next week. Thanks, sir. See ya. Thanks, all.